Welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large. Coming at you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, as well as with video here on YouTube. This week, I have special guest Ron Miscavige Sr., infamously known as the father of David Miscavige, the current leader of Scientology, but actually a really great guy and somebody I am very, very proud and happy to know. He has done a great deal of work since escaping from Scientology, including writing a book called Ruthless about his experiences in Scientology. He's been featured on 2020 and various other shows. He has gone around and made it a part of his business to discuss Scientology as a not great group. And so he's agreed to come on my podcast. We're going to have some talk here and see what we can uh, what we can talk about in terms of Scientology and other things as well. Ron, thank you very much and welcome to my show. Hi, Chris. It's my pleasure. I, I really mean that. I'm glad you asked me to come on. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, why don't we, um, you know, there's a lot of things to talk about here with Scientology. Of course, you have discussed, you know, being the father of the current leader. I don't think we need to go over that territory again a whole lot because right. it is pretty well covered. Um, right. I did want to kind of start by asking about this, um, because this isn't, I've never really seen anyone talk about this other than Mark Headley mentioning it in his book a bit in terms of life on the Sea Org base, the international management base in right. in San Jacinto, right? Yeah. How, how many years did you live there? I lived there for 26 and a half years. Damn. Actually, wait a minute. I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly. 26 years and nine months. Wow. Wow. And, I, yeah. you know, I was in the Sea Org for 17 years. I mean, you got yeah. me. You got me beat by 10 years. Yeah. And, and, and that's on staff. That's on staff. But I was in Scientology proper for 42 years, though. Wow. Wow. So, okay. So what year did you get to the Int Base? I got there in 1985 on... June thirtieth, okay, and uh, I I got there with all of my gear. I like a fool sent twenty six packages with my gear, and you know I thought this is going to be handy there. And when I when I got there, the person who was in charge for birthing and stuff gave me a dresser that was about this wide and this high. In other words, it was about two feet high and one foot wide, and that was supposed to accommodate all of my belongings. Now, I got there, and then there was having an outing on uh, July 4th, all right? Mm -hmm. I got there on the 30th, and instead of going to the outing, I stayed behind, and I scrounged up a, uh, a standalone uh, armoire. You know, it put my hang-up clothes in and stuff. And I, I got that out of a commons area. This is all by myself, and I spent the entire day doing this. And I can remember... Uh, Mark Yeager at the time said to me, Ron, when the door is open, you got to walk through it. You get a day off, you got to take it. And that was the advice he gave me that it was nice that I set up my birthing, but I should have taken the day off. You know? Anyway, that was my introduction to uh, life at the international base. I never thought I would be working with, uh, as an example, really good friend of mine, Charlie Rush, who's since died. And uh, it was a shame to see him go because he was a wonderful guy. He was my, um, what do you call it when you first get into the Sea Org? Your, your partner? Your, oh, yeah, like your buddy. Your buddy, that's right. Yeah. He, he was my buddy and he showed me the ropes and stuff. And listen, there were times when I worked with him on a studio that was up on top of the hill in the end base called the Mid Res, which was short for Middle Reservoir, but it was converted into a studio itself. And we'd be working it for 24 hours. And to get some rest, we'd lay down in one of the sound boots and cover ourselves up with foam insulation. I mean, just really degraded shit, you know? Yeah. But that that was part of the beat. And I, I lived that way for 26 and a half years. The beginning, since it was a new adventure, I, I had, to be honest with you, I had some fun. I mean, one of the first things I did was I did an album with Edgar Winter and, um, Maybe some of your listeners would, as a matter of fact, the older ones would know who that is. 
he wrote Frankenstein, you know, that was ba bum bum ba da da ba bum bum ba da you know. Anyway, I did an album with him based on the book Mission Earth and uh, did some other stuff with celebs. I, I played with Isaac Hayes and things. And the beginning of it, I, I got to say, hard work and uh, but fun. Absolutely, yeah. It, it was. But it went like that as the years went by. Right. I, I, I experienced the exact same curve. I know exactly what you mean. And of yeah. course, we wouldn't have stayed all those years if it was if there had never been good moments, you know? Well, no, I, I agree. And well, look at, I'm sure you felt the same way as, as I did. And I actually thought I was doing something to help all of mankind. I mean, look, I recruited people for the sea organization. I did videos touting the lectures. You may have seen them as a staff member down in back, you know, selling lectures for the church. I truly was a cool aid drinker. I was completely convinced that this technology was going to change the face of Earth and uh, everything would be better if, as long as we got it out to everybody, you know? I totally uh, know. I, I felt that, that, exactly the same way. Yeah, and that's why I stayed, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly why I stayed. You know, I knew Charlie Rush also. When he came down to pack, he ended up getting busted for whatever reason. And he came down and he was, Wait, a, he was a great guy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna interrupt you. Yeah. Do you know what he got busted for? I never found out. I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah, what? Okay. We are in England and we're at the International Association of Scientologists meeting, which is in October of every year or around that time. Okay. We're at what's called the Patrons Ball. There's uh, a big event that David does. Uh, these days, he does all the talking, okay? And he gives all the wins and all the expansion, and everything of Scientology. And then the next day, there's a thing called what's called the Patrons Ball, where people who are the high rollers and people who have donated large sums of money have a dinner. The tent over there, which is about a football field at least in size, is decorated so you'd swear it was like the Taj Mahal. I don't know what the hell they spend on it, but it is a ton of money. And we're at the patrons' ball, and the Golden Era musicians would play dinner music for the first hour and a half or so. And then there'd be a very short intermission, and we'd do a show. And that show was rehearsed within an inch of our lives. Now, Charlie was in charge of the electricity coming to all of the speakers and everything that had to do with lighting, the band on the stage, okay? Yep. So he was at that, that critical point where you took all this juice and you had various outlets that would go to the different uh, parts of the, the event. He forgot to put a surge protector on it. And all of a sudden, the electricity went boom, surge, blew all the lights out the stage went blank i remember isaac hayes coming on the stage to try to you know calm the cry down and say oh well, look we're going to handle this but that was in david miscavige's eyes the flap of the century it reflected badly on him he thought that was the end of charlie rush that broke his back and he was sent to pack and that is why he ended up in pack jesus and he ended up being a dishwasher for years yeah, I know. And uh, yeah, very competent guy, very good drummer. Him and Fernando, that was the other drummer, Fernando Gamboa. Sometimes we'd do a gig and we'd have two sets of drums and they would play in syn synchronized with each other. It was unbelievable to see. I mean, if you want to call musicianship the unexpected and spectacular, that was it. I mean, that, that was a real hit. And him and Fernando were, were just great. They're both great drummers. But Charlie hit the skids. And let me tell you, you do something like that. There is no forgiveness. There's no per, there's no purgatory like they have in a Catholic church. You do that, you go to hell forever. And exactly. That's Charlie. Yeah. And that is, and that and he was actually a really good at, uh, example or demonstration of the unforgivingness of what goes yeah. on there. You know, because yeah. none of us who were now his coworkers, his friends, 
you know, could even know why he was busted because right. uh, then we might judge David Miscavige badly if we knew that. And yeah. he could never talk about it. And he never did, as far as I know. And nope. he just took his licks and he spent years just to try to get promoted out of the dishwasher job and move up to where he could interact with public again, calling them on the phones. That was the big promotion he got before he, he unfortunately uh, got sick and, and, and ended up dying. And I was very sad when I heard about that. Yeah, well, didn't he go in a calling unit with Lisa Hoden and some other people? Yep, that's exactly what he did. Yeah. And it took him a tremendous amount of effort to get out of the galley just to be able to do that. And believe me, that call-in place was its own kind of hell. That was no, that yeah. was no picnic he moved into. Oh, come you know? on. It's, 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 everything is forgiven. What, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's, it's of all course. pleasure, you know. <laughs> after I wrote the book, I hadn't started my channel yet. But after I was interviewed on, you know, 2020, Megyn Kelly, Late Night with Seth Meyer, Australian TV, English TV, in other words, all over the world. I got the number of that unit and I called and I spoke to them and it was all friendly. I just wanted to talk to them. I didn't talk about my leaving. And Charlie said, man, I was so glad to hear from you because I remember when you came here and we needed so many guys in the band and you recruited them. Not to my wearing a medal or anything, but I did, you know. And then I spoke to Lisa, and she was very friendly. And I can't think of the other girl's name, but it was a very friendly conversation. Went on for about 15 minutes, and I just said, hey, guys, very nice talking to you. And they said, Ron, we love you. Thanks for calling. Wow. Nothing. I did not. Yeah. I've never heard that. I did not know you did that. You want to know something? That's a first. I've never told that to anybody. <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you. So you have a scoop, okay? <laughs> All right, cool. All right. I, well, I, me... hope, I, I hope they don't <laughs> get killed for this because Lisa is still alive, you know, and they're just... Yeah, they'll be fine. Um, okay, let me ask you about this then. This is another thing yeah. I've been intensely curious about. Um, I have never met Shelly Miscavige. I met David. Okay. I met yeah. a lot of people from Int. I've met a lot of people who knew Shelly. Now, Shelly's a touchy subject. She, you know, obviously we wear Shelly and we talk about that. But she was married to David Miscavige for decades, you know, worked with him, was his assistant. Yeah. What was she like to you and for you how, as a person? Well, how can I put this without, and uh, uh, believe me, I, I don't want to, throw her under the bus because she doesn't deserve to be thrown under the bus to be honest with you she was nice to me she was quite nice to me but most of our interaction was based on this to get me to behave in a certain manner that would be befitting me having the miscavige name because if i were to act untoward in any way toward the church or maybe be clowning it up or do various things that would reflect badly on COB. And most of our interaction was based on her talking to me about that. There were some friendly moments. I, I shouldn't say that was the only thing, but that was the main thing. And there were times when I, I'd go in there and I would mess up or something and she'd say, okay, well, let me tell you, here's how you can handle it. And she'd give me good advice. Um, but it was never like, she was my daughter-in-law and like in, in the world, you'd go and give somebody a big hug or a kiss on the lips, not on, on the cheek, rather, you know, it, it wasn't that type of relationship. She was very protective of COB. And you've read the Simon Boulevard policies. Oh yeah. Very much so. She, she was like Manuel Suez. That was it. That, yeah. that chick's name. Yeah. Seance. Yeah. That's how she was. She was very, very protective of David and, would do anything to help him and pick out his clothes and things like that. And just in any way act as a, a real service facility to him that I, I will, I will say that. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I have, I have gone back and forth on her because I very, 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 very much sympathize with her position and with the, and with the, the unfortunate, you know, circumstances that she's under now, uh, yeah. to say the least. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Uh, no, I know. 
you know, at the same time, I look at her as somebody who enabled David Miscavige for many years as well, because she assisted him and worked with him. And, and there wasn't like she was under some kind of physical threat to do that. No, Very no. Threat, you know, so she definitely voluntarily was doing that work. And so I kind of go, well, yeah, I sympathize with her, but I sympathize with her to a point. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be judgy at the same time. I just kind of wondered what was she like as a person, you know? Well, that's how she was. And I can't say anything bad about her. I mean, just she, she ran the, the party line. In other words, it was all to the good of the entire planet. And the main thing was to keep bad stuff off of David's lines so he wouldn't get interbulated, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, just our, our communication was mostly on me being a representative of the family. Although I had the fucking name first, excuse my French. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my name happens to be Ron Miscavige. And I remember David when he was like that big when he was born, you know? And, right. and when he was born, boy, I'll tell you, he was... I remember the day as if it were yesterday, and that's, I guess, what, 58 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, poor kid had asthma, and I, I really pitied him because this is a son of a bitch to walk around with that, especially as a baby, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I took care of him, and I, I'm i the one that took him to the doctor to get the shots and everything, and I would do my nut trying to come and figure out what different ways to handle it, you know? Well, you know the story, how he, he got the auditing and, yeah. and he, he was, that 45 minute session with Frank Ogle, where I took him down for, actually was the epiphany. And I've always meant to use that word. I haven't used it in a while now, uh, of me getting my whole family in Scientology. Because when he walked out of there, he was smiling. And I said, Dave, how's it going? He says, man, he says, I'm handled, you know? Never had another uh, bad asthmatic attack. Wow. Look at, before before we go on, I want to do a little commercial because sure. I have a I have a podcast and it's called well actually my website is called therealronmiscavige dot com. Now I say that because the church in its ever loving forgiveness and graciousness has bought five hundred variations of my name on GoDaddy. So any any time you put in my name other than what I just said the real ron miscavige.com they will take you to a hate site and if you look at their hate site i should have been shot at least a week ago okay this is they're very gracious in the lies they tell they're really good at it you know but but that's the name of, and also i have a podcast on that so if you go on the website you can see and i've introduced and i've interviewed you about three weeks ago so the followers of chris you're listening in you can go and Watch the interview I did with him. Now it's reversed. So he's introducing, <laughs> he's interviewing me. But again, well, it's therealronmiscavige.com. Go on. Excellent. Well, I was going to. Oh, oh, wait, wait, oh, wait. Yeah, I, yeah. I forgot to tell you. For the first hundred viewers who listen to it this week, you will receive $100,000. <laughs> oh, no, it's Monopoly money, but still, it's money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I was, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because it's more than just a commercial. It's actually another point on Scientology's part, because I yeah. actually did a little research project. And I went and I looked up almost every single anti-critic, you know, hater site that they've put together and all the links to those sites. And you, my friend, are the most hated because they have more links to your hate site than any other critic. Leah, Alex Gibney, um, you know, Mark Headley, any of these guys are pale in comparison. Okay, here. That calls for this. <laughs> That's my piano. There we go. Ta-da! Ta -da, I'm the champion. Most hated person. Well, there you go. I, you know, by looking at how much they're spending to, you know, keep your name tarnished, that is definitely a, a piece of truth. And um, I will tell you how effective it is. I don't care at all. Say what you want. Say what you want. And you have the same attitude. And Chris, I got to tell you, I appreciate you for what you're doing 
and having the same goddamn attitude that I, as I do. We talked about this. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's just silly. So, okay. Let me ask you this. So on the, you know, so 26 years, you're at the int base, you're behind the bars, you're doing the work, you're, you know, you're doing your thing. What's it actually like there? I mean, you were there for a lot of years. What was it yeah. like for all those years? 26 years and nine months. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what it was like. It's actually a different world. It's a different mindset than anything you could experience in real life. When I say real life, I'm talking about here where I live in Wisconsin, where you go out and you go to a store and there's people there or I play gigs and I meet people or I have neighbors who I interact with. One of the things that I didn't realize I missed was this, seeing little kids. There's none there. That's right. And like like when, when I go to one of my favorite grocery stores here, which is called Pick and Save, these little kids, especially the little girls, are coming in with their moms. and They're like about two feet tall. Sometimes I'll walk over to them and say, wait a minute, what's your name? And they'll say, your name, your name is Clarice. I've been looking for you for a week. I have this from, from the birthday man, and I'll give them a dollar. I says, this is from the birthday man. And they'll hold it up and say, wow. It's, it's this amazement, you know, of a little kid. And it, it just thrills me to do this because I have no family anymore. It's it's like my surrogate family, all the little kids I see. And it, it's very devastating to a person for them to take your family away. On this point alone, they should be, they should be pushed out of business, not just shut down, but just close the goddamn doors, lock up the joint and say, look, go home, get a job, get the hell out of here, you know, end it. Let everybody talk to each other because, as I say, that, that's like a substitute for seeing my great-grandchildren because that's about how old they would be now, which I've never met. I've, wow. I, I, don't, I don't know how many. I don't know how many great-grandchildren I have. But both of my daughters, their children, which is my grandchildren, whom I really got along with absolutely well, just love their company, and they love mine. I don't have to guess on that. That's gone. And that is the main thing that you miss at the int base. There's no little kids. And then after you're there for a while, after you've received a few beatings, and I'm not talking about physical beatings, I'm talking about verbal. I'm talking about verbal pushing you into a small ball, making you think you're not worth anything, that what you've done can never be forgiven. You'll never live up to what is expected of you or telling us that L. Ron Hubbard said that Golden Era Productions is the worst organization ever in the history of the C organization. You hear enough of this and you kind of pull in your reach for life. And in doing that, you live like a gray life. I don't know how else to put it, but it's, it's very gray. It may be the way people felt like in East Germany when the Stasi was running it, you know, the, the secret police there, or maybe in, in Russia when the, the communism was running, but it, it is not a good feeling. And you become so acclimated to it that you don't even know that you're that way. That's the dangerous thing. That's the dangerous thing. And you're just hoping that somehow, some way things can get better. As a matter of fact, my wife who's the eternal optimist and it was the reason we stayed there as long as we did, would say to me, Ron, I know it's going to get better. It's got to get better. And I used to say to her, Becky, if there were a boulder running down the mountain, do you think that boulder would stop and start rolling up the mountain? Because if things are going badly, the laws of momentum with things, nothing changing, they will continue to go more so in that direction and get worse and worse. Nonetheless, you stick it out. And one of the main reasons you stick it out, and I know you felt probably the same way. I'm, I'm speaking for you now. You could always dig down and think, well, at least I'm doing my best to help every man, woman, and child on this planet lead a better life. Precisely. That is exactly yeah. why we would endure the crap we endured. That's, yep. that's the only way I made it through the RPF. That's the only yeah. way I, I made it through all those years myself as well. Because yeah. sometimes you'd look around and you just go, man, what am I doing? 
And then you'd think, well, you know, this is all the, for the greater good. I'm, 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 I'm making these sacrifices because I'm helping people. And yeah, you know, you just kind of put yeah. up, put your head down and hope you don't get noticed too much too often and just try to do your work. That, that's a good way to put it, Chris. I, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. Now, you were a salesperson. I want to talk about sales a little bit before you got in the Sea Orgs, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you yeah, matter of fact, I'll tell you some of my stats on selling. Yeah. I started selling in 1959. And uh, I was working at a research plant. And I was, I remember getting a raise. And I got a raise half as much as some other people working the same shift as me, yet I would do double the amount of work, but they were better ass kissers than I were, than I was, you know? And, and they could suck up to people, and I, I just never could do that. But uh, actually a pretty dangerous job, but it really taught me a lot about physics and about life. I worked on research of oil. The place was called hydrocarbon research. I worked on a unit a reactor, a miniature reactor, where the pressure was built up to 3,300 pounds per square inch. Now, that's pretty goddamn high pressure. And we're talking about oil going through there, hydrogenated, so that if you sprung a leak in one of the reciprocal pumps, that would catch fire immediately. It would shoot out like a a flamethrower. And this is what I did. I took stats on this every hour would check all the different components and see how it was doing, make sure everything was running correctly. And then the engineers would figure out if the catalysts were using, yeah, if the catalyst we're using was good enough to make a better product cheaper, that would be more uh, energy efficient than what they were selling. It may sound technical, but I'll tell you this. It was great because one of the other things I did was uh, ran uh, an oxygen producing unit which produced liquid oxygen and i'll tell you how crazy it was and some of the guys there would take a cigarette and put it on one of the leaks coming out to show that it would burn a cigarette time they could have blown up the whole fucking place (laughs) (laughs) and you know this these are the things i worked around but you learn to respect the physical laws of this universe and when you do that you have to must you must gain knowledge about what you're doing or you could die okay that's what i did but anyway i made a short story long but i thought it would be interesting to say you know because this is what i did when i got that raise half the amount i thought you know what i gotta do something different i gotta make some money i remember walking out of hydrocarbons hydrocarbon research in the morning looking at the sun coming up and i thought gotta do something different i saw an ad in the paper it was for a salesperson i went I said, okay, I'll do it. It was wherever cookware. Now, I took a job, and the first year I worked, and I I quit my regular job and did this full time. I was fifth highest salesman in the United States out of thousands of salesmen. That was my first year, okay? That was good promotion for me. And then I took a job selling insurance to make my dad wrong. All right. <laughs> because oh, he used to like none of us have ever done that before. <laughs> but but wait a minute, listen to this. He said to me one time, "You would never make it selling insurance." He had an insurance brokerage, and that was the reason I left there. But he told me that, so I did it to make him wrong. But Chris, he was dead at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> anyway, he really suffered from that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but this, you know. That year that I did it, I got my picture in Newsweek magazine for being the man of the month for Mutual New York Life Insurance Company. Damn. Okay. So that that was, and that that was you know a real star to do that. And uh, did you did you did it come naturally to you as a sort of a fish in the water sort of thing for you, or did you have to learn from others? How did that how'd that go? Well, I'll tell you what came natural to me: confronting people. Hmm. In other words, going out, and I we didn't work door to door, but we had referrals. But I, I was willing to rap on any door in any circumstance. That didn't bother me at all. But I'll be honest with you. I bought books about how to sell. 
and I studied them and I studied selling and between studying and my natural inclination to confront people. Uh, I think that's, that was a winning combination. And the other thing was this, I had to do it because I had four kids at the time. I mean, look, I, I did gigs. I, I did, did pick up gigs with other, with bands in the area, but you can't say, Oh, I'm going to go on the road with this band and you, you need food on the table. And quite honestly, we, we live not high on the hog, but like, uh, I could take my family skiing in the winter time, take three or four days off, and I was never tight for money because I worked hard, you know. Yeah, well, so four kids, man, it, that's nothing to. That's nothing oh yeah, to- I mean, and, and, and there's no excuse. You you feed them, put you know, put them in nice clothes. I should t- I should take my boys to a hair stylist to get their hairs cut. When when your kids, <laughs> they just you know it, it was the way it was, and I take them to the steam bath with me and. Uh, I don't know if you know, it would, it would, it, I was the only non-Jew in a, a club in Philadelphia called the Kamak. It was a Jewish working man's club. And I had friends, Bernie Solomon and Mel Atlin, that recommended me. Because if you ever called to join, they'd say, I'm sorry, membership is full. They only went by referrals. So I'd go down there and, it, you know, my friends in those days, Bernie Solomon, Mel Atlin, Danny Eisenfeld, they taught me all the great Jewish restaurants in Philadelphia, the best place to get cabbage soup, the best place for Luxembourg, uh, you know, uh, chopped liver, you know, great days. But I diverged a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah. That was my fun thing, doing life insurance and selling the cookware. I, I made a considerable amount of money in those days doing that. Uh-huh. But I studied it. I actually studied it. Well, that's a that's interesting. Hubbard, um, you know, I think it was in the 1960s. I think it was what, during this time period while you were, you know, studying and learning and doing your work. Uh, Hubbard was recommending Les Danes materials. He was a salesman yeah. and he wrote materials. And this became sort of dogma for the church. Yeah. And and it wasn't great stuff. It was just kind of what it was. It was sort of, I think that's also where Hubbard came up with the idea of, you know, making a file folder for every single Scientologist and calling it a central files and keeping track of, you know, every re- every letter and correspondence and all that. Um, and, and Les Dane's approach was that there are types of people with types of sales. You know, you got your single female, unattached female, and you've got your Pro, pro buyer and these these kinds of categories of things and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. That's what yeah. I trained in. You came along, uh, and and I was you know this is in the '90s and and 2000s, and you were doing seminars and you were coming down to the base and you started talking about it kind of a different tack on selling. And when I became a salesperson for Scientology for about about a half a year or so, I was I was selling OT levels. I got more out of what you were telling me than anything Les Dane ever said. Well, I'll tell you why you did. Because the stuff that I taught is a natural thing that all people fall into that category. There's no, okay, you could say there's the single working girl, there's the professional buyer. You could categorize all these people. But that's like categorizing all types of psychosis. If you just said everybody's nuts, you you covered all the bases. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's true. If somebody has a psychosis, they're nuts. Okay, fair enough. Now, I did get my data from what L. Ron Hubbard said, though. I got to give credit to that. And we both you and I have talked about Mm -hmm. the beginning, the beginning, the rock bottom Scientology. There's a lot of good data there. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I looked at it as this. Everybody communicates, okay? Everybody communicates. Everybody likes to tell their their problems. So I broke it down into a person who's very good at communication. And I'm not talking about just talking the balls off a brass monkey, you know. I'm talking about a person who will talk and then who will listen and understand what the other person is saying and acknowledging them. In other words, you had to have a good communication cycle. Number two was that you don't take up objections and run with them at length because a person, once you get into taking up an objection, 
you are now off a different track. You're not, you're not selling the person, okay? So you have to know how to handle an objection. And then the third thing is this, enlightenment. And this combined with having a great communication cycle with not taking up objections, but knowing how to handle them so the person doesn't feel brushed off and enlightening the person. And if you can do these three things, as a matter of fact, I tell you, since you and I spoke about this when we lined up this interview, I thought about this and I am actually going to work out a little program where I can do seminars on this. And I might do them online and I'll, I'll see how this goes, you know, because I think, I think it's going to. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Oh, yeah, it would help a lot of people. The only problem I haven't worked out is how to drill it online because I may have to get to get together with people at some meeting place to do it because it should be drilled. But the enlightenment is this. And it's not just pure enlightenment, like saying exercise is good for you. You have to enlighten the person on what you're selling them is more valuable than what they're going to part with to buy that. In other words, if you think uh, you see this shirt for 20 bucks or let's say 50 bucks, ah, that's not worth it. And then you try it on and you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, God damn, I look pretty good in this. Ah, 50 bucks isn't that much. That person has enlightened himself to the benefit of him, what is means something to him being worth more than the price he's paying for it. So if you can accomplish that, enlightening the person to the benefit of him, whatever service or whatever product you're selling, how it benefits him, you got a sale. And anybody who's experienced that, if you were just to think about these three points, you would pretty much agree with that these are natural things. This is not a made up, you know, categorizing people into various ways to handle. Because I'll tell you, I, I read the big league sales. I have a copy of it. And a lot of it is trickery and chicanery. Exactly. You know, you're saying, I just went in the other room and I spoke to the boss and he said, you, we can't cancel the order. That's bullshit. You know, that's used car salesmanship. No. If you're selling a product that actually has a legitimate benefit to benefiting the person and you can inculcate his mind with this product, you enlightening him that it is more to his benefit to have this than keep the money. He'll give you his money for that product. So that's a win-win. You make your living that way and the person getting it is going to improve his life that way. If in fact it will improve his life. And if it doesn't improve his life, get something else and sell. Yeah, exactly. I, um, yeah, there's a couple of points on this. One is um, uh, what you just touched on, I think is very important. The trickery or the chicanery of West State yeah. system is obvious. And yeah. I never liked that either. There was this tagging thing that would happen and it was supposed to look spontaneous, but it never was. And then there was also this business of, yeah, I'm going to go bring this to my manager and see if he come back with something. And, you know, you've got all this stuff all pre-worked out. I don't think people in Scientology, unless they, unless they um, actually did it themselves or saw behind the scenes somehow, realized how much kind of trickery and how much kind of free setup was going on when they Amen. were sold, you know? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, that, all came from, that all came from Les Dane. Well, did you, were you, did you mention it to me when we talked before? Um, maybe not. I, like the Reges have all the data about the guy's uh, CS. Yep. They know what his buttons are. They're privy to his PC folder, which you, you, you shouldn't have be privy to this. But look, it's all smoke and mirrors. Let's face it. Exactly. Scientology con. If you got that, you got everything. Okay. Well, exactly. I just wanted to comp I wanted to contrast that a little bit with what you were talking yeah. about because I think it's important for people to understand. Yeah, you're that, right. You're right you know, in doing that because yeah. they, they, they it, it's trickery. That's what the, the Les Dane is. And yeah. I, I just couldn't do it. I, I never did it as, as a salesman. Yeah. I remember one time when I was selling life insurance, I used to sell endowments and uh, it was non-cancelable. That meant that the company couldn't cancel 
the policy. And I went back to see this person for some other reason. And they said, you know, I really can't afford this, but look, luck be with me. I can't cancel it. I said, hey, listen, that doesn't mean that you can't cancel it. That means that we can't cancel it. And it felt so much better telling her the truth. Now, a less than advocate would have said, yeah, well, you're right. You can't cancel it. And we're done with it, you know? That's right. That's exactly right. And that was the yeah. kind of thing that he preached. And I yeah. think that's one reason why Hubbard latched onto it, to be honest with you. Well, um, he was a con man. Yeah. Boy, I exactly. mean, what the hell? Why wouldn't you like it then, you know? Exactly. Uh, and to this day, they still use that stuff and they still recommend it. And it's official church dogma. Whereas I'm sure they've probably burned all of the, you know, seminars and things you did yeah. uh, at this point. They're probably like, get Rod Muscat, see, get rid of that guy. What are you talking yeah. about? I, I wish I could find that manual I did because that, that was, it had all this stuff in, you know, but I, yeah. I, I, I know I, I haven't forgotten it, but it was a nice manual. I'd just like to have it for, uh, yeah, for time's sake, you know. That's yes. right. Well, I'll tell you one. I'll I'll tell you one last thing uh, on the sales thing that uh, to this day again has stuck with me, and I have found very useful. And not because I don't do sales as such, but I, you know, do change hearts and minds. And one of the ways that yeah. I have gone about doing that, and I learned this from you, is that if you're going to get somebody to a change to change their mind about something, which is basically what a sale is. It is a small series of agreements. That yep. was something that you said that no one had ever said before. And I thought, that makes sense. And I started using that in yeah. life when I was a Scientologist and with sales. But I've, yeah. but I've always used that sense, which is, you know, you get, you get them to agree to one thing and then another and another. And as long as you're being honest, there's nothing wrong with this. It's not true. No. You know. So anyway, I just wanted to credit you with that because I found that to be very useful. Well, I'm going to follow that up with this. And I appreciate you telling me that. I thank you very much. Do you know how I used to write speeches? No, tell me. <laughs> Wouldn't you like that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you how I did it. This is no baloney. As, wait, who was it? Carlson? What was the comedian's name? Oh, George, Car George, uh, George, George Carlin. Carlin, yeah. Yeah, he had, you remember, believe it or not? Uh-huh. The, the thing, okay, he had a little thing called, it's no bullshit, <laughs> <laughs> instead of believe it or not. Now, here's how I used to write speeches. And I did it one time successfully in Philadelphia, and then I adopted it after that. And this is based on gradient agreements. I took a yellow pad, you know, like a legal pad. Yep. Something, you know, like about that size, but the yellow pad, right? You don't have to use the yellow pad, but that's what I used. And I draw, I drew what I expected the crowd to be in a state of mind when I started. And I would draw people there and their mind was curious or uh, is this the truth? Is he going to be a liar? And I, I drew this on a space paper. And then I took another PC, yellow pad paper, and I put on it what I wanted the end result to be, people reaching for Scientology. I want to buy that book. I want to sign it for a service. Then what I did is I took the first piece of paper and then I wrote out what would be the easiest agreement I could get from that, from the people that would change it at least that little bit toward I wanted them to be. Then I took another piece of paper and from that state, I figured what would be the next piece of agreement. And I did this. And as a matter of fact, I did it in Philadelphia. And they set up a meeting for me, for public. And it was, come to this seminar given by Ron Miscavige about Dianetics. Everyone will receive a past life experience. And I said to the people, what the fuck are you lining me up for? You know? <laughs> right. I mean, and then not only that, they booked it on the night of the Super Bowl. And I said, look, it's the night of the Super Bowl. Jesus Christ, wh where's your mind? Oh, you're just CI. I said, I'm CI. <laughs> now, that's when I did it. And we had over 100 people show up for it. And they paid six bucks a piece to get in. And at the end, we had people going over to where the books were being sold wanting to buy a book, wanting to get more information. 
And I saw that that worked. And that's how I wrote that speech. And not only that, in the local paper, the daily news, the inside spread was about the entire thing. And it was, they quoted me correctly. And they said, and the last thing Mr. Miscavige said is this, what if you don't do this, but on your dying deathbed, think, I wonder if that guy was telling the truth. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Wow. That was it. I was sold on that's the way to do it. And I'm telling you, Chris, try it sometime. Just put down, but do it with figures, not just words, you know, and you can put words in there, but, and then put the end result, what you want it to be. And just what would be the next easiest agreement? Like you could say to the people in the room, you know, this is a pretty nice room. Don't you agree? Or what do you think? Yeah, I do. I think it's, you know, but get their agreement. And then is, is this room cold enough for you? Is it warm enough? Could be, well, good. I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit. So, okay, good. An agreement, simple, little gradient agreements. And that's how I started doing that with a yellow legal pad. And I think I had 36 points I got to agreements on before I got to the end. Yep. And that was it. At the end, everybody, we had, we had a kick out, I think, three or four people. I had, you know, not bodyguards, but they were hecklers. We just got rid of them. But everybody else, and we gave them their money back, you know. Yep. And the other people, they all reached for Scientology. I don't know how many books they sold, but the downfall was this. A lot of the org staff ended up at the end talking to each other. Just like bullshit, man, I tell you. I, I couldn't believe it. I, I went around and I started selling books. But they're just not professionals. And nice people, but not pros, you know? Right. Which is pretty much a, a description of most org staff you know they're they're nice yeah. people they, they mean well but they don't really know what they're doing and and no. you know and this and the stuff they learn doesn't really particularly teach them okay so that was grainy agreements and that, that was how i did it. and i think that answers your question absolutely thank you for that yeah um yeah and so um okay so getting back to the the int base for a minute because i want to i want to kind of draw out from you um you know, what that experience was like. I mean, again, 26 years, tons of things happened. What did you, what was your opinion as a professional musician or a performer of Hubbard's writings on music and art? Because he, he, a lot of people don't know this, but he wrote stuff on that. He did write stuff on it. And the stuff he wrote was more legitimate than his talent in the area. I'll be honest with you, hmm. because we would get tapes of him playing a melody and it was really just to make something out of it. You really had to exert your artistic ability to turn it into a melody. We'd have to put chords to it. And, and the guys were very good at it. I remember, I don't want to name the names because they're still there and they sure. may get in trouble. So I'm not going to throw them under the bus. Sure. But that that's, of course I've done that my whole life. I've composed my whole life. So I could take a melody that somebody else wrote write a nice set of chords to it and, and make it sound nice. And um, that, that was the first time that I realized something was wrong with L. Ron Hubbard because some of the later tapes we got, he would talk like this. He would say, now I, I, I this um, uh, 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 tape is, uh, would we, you, 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 you should play for the, 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 the beginning. And I, wait, wait a minute. And then I found out after I get out, he had a stroke prior to that. Right. Right. And of course, nobody in that room would say anything about how he sounded. You just wouldn't do it. And you knew. And of course, these are all musicians and everybody noticed it because they weren't incompetent boobs. You know, in order to become a musician, you have to have the self-discipline to practice and, and exert yourself in a certain direction that that discipline carries over into other parts of your life. <clears throat> and uh, in other words, I think a lot of musicians are smarter than the average run of the bear. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to doubt myself. I'm just talking right. about musicians in general. <laughs> well, I would actually agree with you because what you just said about discipline and practice is very, very yeah. true. Yeah. That's how do yeah. you get to Carnegie Hall? You know what I mean? It's not inherent talent. It is practice, baby. That's exactly right. Yep. And I'll tell you where I got a lot of my discipline. 
from the United States Marine Corps. And I went in boot camp. I couldn't get up in the morning prior to that. My mom would have a hell of a time getting me out of bed. The first night was like uh, Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Ye who enter here, abandon all hope. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when that drill instructor came in the next morning, the night before he left, he said, listen, I'm going to come in here at 6 o'clock in the morning. And if you're not all in front of your bunks, standing at attention, God help you. I remember my eyes come open like that. And I jumped out of bed and he walked in a room. I had my sheets and I was standing in front of the bunk. There was a guy in the bunk next to me. His name was Belts. He was in an upper bunk. He was laying in bed. The DI come over, pushed him up in the air and he came through the air and bounced his head off one of the things and fell on the ground. And that, that's how it started. Three months later, I said, I can make myself do anything. And I, I acquired self-discipline in a short three months. It was probably the best investment in time in my life. Wow. Wow. And it helped me in everything and studying, studying Scientology, studying how to sell, studying how to play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I got a, uh, a recording contract with Chapel's Pub, excuse me, with Paula De Records in England in 1974. The BBC heard it. They liked it so much. They wanted me to pay, play on the air. And by the way, you can read about this in my book. I should mention it. Christ. The book I have is called Rootless, Scientology, My Son, David Miscavige, and Me. But if you go on my website, therealronmiscavige.com, the Real you can see where the book is. You can order the book. As a matter of fact, I have the album on there. It's under music and media, and I digitized it. So if you want to hear it or buy it, go to that, and you'll hear it. I call it timeless. I didn't call it that in England, but you can hear the stuff that I do. And, right. uh, nice. Well, yeah, I, well, I, you know, I read that book, Ruthless, when it came out, and I yeah. went, and I was I was impressed. It was a good book. Yeah, and it, and it covered a lot of territory. Um, has there been anything else? Um, well, that, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Did I answer your question about Hubbard? Uh, about I think so. I wanted to. I wanted. I was just about to ask. Was there anything else about Hubbard's writings about music or art? Because he styled himself as not just a writer, but a master of art and artistry. And I kind of wondered with, you know, from some from the perspective of a professional such as yourself, and I've talked to Jeff Levin and I've talked to other professional, you know, in the field who have who've read over Hubbard's stuff or were involved with him in any way. What, what, then, what did Jeff say? I'm, I'm curious. He had uh, similar things. He said there were some things that Hubbard wrote and some things in the philosophy that were very sensible and made sense to him. But uh, but he didn't really know, you know, his research methods and the way he was going about doing things were not anything particularly impressive or something yeah. that, you know, that, that changed their life as a professional. No, I, well, and by the way, Jeff worked with L. Ron Hubbard on the ship. Yes, he did. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I would say that the way he wrote about it, even though it was true, it was a bit pedestrian. In other words, uh, he would analyze things. He'd take it apart and give you his take on it. Mm -hmm. One thing he did say that I will say I got, I, I thought it was pretty good. Um, I, I can't think of the first part of it. Boy, how did that? But basically, it's the unexpected and spectacular is what is really like the guide on in music. If you can do something unexpected and spectacular, that's real showmanship. Hmm. As an example, when Charlie Rush and Fernando Gamboa would play two sets of drums, nobody expected they'd be playing in exact synchronous with each other. That was spectacular. Right. Okay? Right. A guy comes out. And you think he's going to do a handstand and he does a one arm handstand. That's spectacular. People will applaud that. And I, that was something I got out of it. But all these other things like phrasing that he talked about, uh, he talked about uh, integration in art, which, which is a legitimate thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the basic stuff was good, but. It, other than that one point that I just mentioned to you, I wouldn't say it was life-changing for me. Right. Cool. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, I wanted to get your feedback on that. Yeah. And now, it, working as a musician at Golden Era Productions, right? You guys were the band that put together music for the events, for, yeah. the, for the films. They do tech films. They do these public films. The commercials, the advertisements, promotion, all of that stuff comes out of gold. Right. How... Was there any understanding of the process by the senior people or was it just like right, like the rest of the place was run, kind of a ruthless dictatorship? Yeah, it was wondering, a nightmare. Was it, it was a nightmare. I, I yeah, was it was a fucking creative, nightmare. Yeah, what was the creative environment like there? It was like living in a nightmare. <laughs> okay, tell me Yeah, more. I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> and, but the, here, the downside is you can't wake up. Right. You know, if you're having a nightmare, thinking you're back at the end base and your eyes pop open, you think, oh, Christ, great, I'm in my bedroom, you know? Right. But there, then the, the timetable for getting things done was it's always one that, that you get it done yesterday. And it was pressure all the time. And I know they say uh, pressure and time creates diamonds. That's fair enough. I don't want to be a fucking diamond, all right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be a musician who produces nice stuff. And we would get things done. And sometimes the quality of it had to be sacrificed because that was as good as we could do. And we were absolutely made wrong for that, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess it's as good as we're going to get. So we're going to have to go with it, you know? And it got to the point, listen to this, <clears throat> where we weren't even allowed to write melodies for different things at the IAS event. We had to take popular songs and turn them into uh, a piece to be used on a subject like if we were wise i remember this, we used taking care of business you know right and right. we were not even allowed to write our own stuff for that it just got worse and worse as i went along it you know, went be, go on. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because i wondered as a sea org member i remember when there were there was a period of time where music started coming out at the events that was clearly sampled from popular yeah. music, and I wondered what's up with that because you guys were doing original work before that. That was what was up with that, and it wasn't sampled. We had to play all those parts. Right. Those those are precise arrangements, and I mean, you know, the guys who did the arrangements, they were very creative, and it just, but it was very disappointing that you couldn't exhibit any uh, art because you were considered a yeah, low life you know you, you're not gonna you're not worth anything and just terrible way to live honestly yeah a horrible any, any any anybody thinking about going into scientology go get your fucking head examined that's what i say <laughs> no i'm i'm serious yeah man. i know i know you know or, or pick a fight with somebody and get a good beating and maybe you'll come to your senses you know right like friday night you went to the worst area of town and insult somebody and get the, get the slop knocked out of you, you know, and you wake up exactly. and think about what the hell was I thinking about? You know? Exactly. At least it'll all be over in one day and you can get on yep. with your life. Unlike yep. us poor sods, we spent years doing this crap. What is there anything else about life at the Ant Base you'd like to comment on that you haven't particularly spoken about before? I, I, I didn't ask you this before, prep you for this, so I'm, I, I'm putting you on the spot, but. Well, that's okay. I mean, I'm used to being on the spot, you know? <laughs> I am. Cool. Be able to stand up to something and handle it. Be able to stand up to surprise and handle it. You know, that, that's look, the worst things are the cooler you have to be. So you put me on the spot. Now, should I start stuttering and not be able to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> right. What could I tell you about it? Okay, I'll tell you. Don't go there. If I can summarize everything, do not go there. It's a bad place. Right. All right. Right. And if you want to find out a lot about it, go to the real Ron .com and you can see all the interviews I did. And one was with you and it was a great interview, man. I'm telling you, I, I enjoyed the hell out of that. And it wasn't until I did the interview with you that I realized how smart you were. And I say that as a true compliment. I'm not trying to borrow money from you, you know? No, you, you did a great job, man. Thank you. But, uh, it, it, it is just go to the real run .com. You can see, hear my album on there. You can hear the, you can see the various interviews. And if you'd like to be interviewed, I have a platform for you to tell your story. I won't throw you under the bus. 
I'm like you, Chris. You're not going to change anything about what I'm saying. People come on your show and you'll, you'll be represented by a true interview of what you did. And this is what the networks won't do. I was interviewed for over eight hours for 2020. They had maybe 15 or 18 minutes of me on the show. And it wasn't really the story I wanted to tell at all. All right. I would that, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to segue to this as sort of the last thing to talk to you about is was this experience. I was I was really curious about it because I heard you tell Leah eight hours and they used 20 minutes. And I thought, wow. Yeah. I, well, did you have any kind of control or creative thing? Did they promise anything to you before you went there? How did that process go? I had as much control as an ant would have driving a bulldozer, okay? Zero, nada, nothing, okay? Wow. None. They didn't promise me anything, but they acted like it was all going to be fair. Right. All, all of them. Right. They acted like, oh, this is good, you know, and it's just, you know, I say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I'll never do it again. Yeah. You know, that that is the reason I started the podcast. So I can give people a fair shot at telling their story. And they know when they come on, their story is going to be aired. You see, I, I don't edit it at all. So as soon as it's done, I'll turn it off and say, are you happy with it? And they say, yep, good. Five minutes later, it's on the air. There you go. No no editing, you know? Yep. I, I do exactly the same thing. Unless there's something specific they want taken out. Or if there's some fumble bumble, fine, I'll edit that out. But otherwise, it's it's exactly what we talked about. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the honest way to go about it. And I think uh, that it's the most interesting way to go about it, to be honest. Yeah, it is. You know, cool, man. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up now because I think we've used our time and I think we've covered some great territory here. You've certainly answered my questions and uh, given me answers I didn't necessarily expect, which was great. Good. So, yeah. So thank you for that. Okay. All right. So let me just do my little show outro and we'll be done. Okay. okay, guys. So everybody here who's watched this show, thank you very much for coming around and watching my podcast and listening to what we had to say. Please leave any comments or uh, criticisms or uh, suggestions in the comment section below, whether it's good, bad or sideways. And I will see you guys next week. Bye bye.